Welcome to John Gets Games. This is the second and final part of my Board Game Geek Con 2018 impressions vlog. And as I mentioned in the first part, I played 26 total games that were new to me at this convention, and I covered the first 13 in alphabetical order in the first part. So if you'd like to watch that one, then uh, just go ahead and click the little I in the top of the screen to jump over there. And as you can see, I have the other 13 games listed here. So feel free to skip ahead to the game that you are most interested in. Now, before we jump in, I would like to briefly ask that if you enjoyed this video, you please consider clicking the like button down below as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Also, if you would like to directly support the channel and the creation of future videos like this one, then please go to johngetsgames.com support to see a variety of ways with which you could do that, including voting on one of the playthroughs that I uh, film each month. All right, without further ado, let's jump into the list. Now, the first game I'll be covering in the second part is Pioneer Days. This one was published by Tasty Mistral Games, and it is a dice drafting game that thematically puts you in the role of settlers who are packing up their wagons and heading west in um, America, you know, 150 years ago or so. Now, mechanically, the way this works is you are going to roll, uh, you're going to pull dice out of a bag, and you're going to pull one more than the number of players, and then you will roll them, and they are all d6s, and on each side of these dice are one of the six actions that are available in the game. Now, uh, every person will draft a single die in each round, and the dice will let you do one of three different things when you draft them. You can either take the die and then do the action that is on that die, and it might involve uh, gathering cattle, or um, doing some prospecting, or uh, purchasing equipment. Uh, or, instead of doing the action, you can take the money that is associated with that action on the board. So, you can simply take the die and take some money, and the last thing you can do is, instead of taking the action or the money, you can draft the uh, townsfolk person that is associated with that spot on the player uh, on the the central board and then you put that person into your area where they will most likely give you some sort of ongoing benefit and then all of them give you a conditional end game victory point bonus if you have them at the end of the game and there are ways to lose your townsfolk while you are playing now, um, everybody will be drafting one die, like I said, and choosing one of those three options with each die they take. And then at the end of every round, there's going to be a single die left over, and there are four different colored dice in the game. And so what you do is you look to the middle of the board with this disaster track, and you look to the track that is associated with the color of the dice. Actually, sorry, there are five different uh, colored dice in the game, uh, and there are four different disasters. And if you have a red die left over, then that means you move the red disaster track forward. If you have a blue die uh, left over, then you move the blue disaster track left. Uh, uh, forward, and if you have a black die, then you move all of them. <laughs> That's why I got slightly mixed up right there. So these disasters, once they get to the end of the track, will hit everybody um, for the same amount for a specific type of thing. Like if it is a raid, then everybody's going to lose a bunch of money. If it is um, uh, a plague, then people are going to lose any of their uh, people that they have that they do not uh, have medicine to be able to uh, help out. So if you have two medicine and four people, then you have to choose two people that are going to die off, and then you won't have the the, uh, access to their ability anymore, and probably more importantly, you don't have access to their endgame conditional victory points, which is one thing you're really trying to go for. Now, you're going to play through, I believe it was four five-day weeks, which means um, four uh, overall rounds of five drafts. So that is 20 drafts that you're going to go through as you're playing the game. And after every one of these weeks, you uh, find yourself at a town, and you um, show this mechanically by revealing a couple shuffle up cards that will let you cash in certain resources to get these um, uh, tokens, which give you a lot of points. And so you are, as you're playing the game, you're trying to build up a bit of an engine because you have equipment that might allow uh, certain actions that you take uh, to do more beneficial stuff. You're also trying to get townsfolk people to give you lots of points and also get the stuff that you need to cash them in at the next town that you're heading towards in each one of these rounds. Now, overall, I think this is a really great design. Uh, from a dice drafting perspective, it's very clean. I love the idea that when you take these dice, you have three different options and you need to choose the right one. Obviously, when you take a die, you are then removing that option from your opponents, so you also have to consider what your opponents are trying to do. Uh, but also, at the same time, there are lots of different ways you can run down with this game. Uh, you can uh, Obviously, you're trying to get stuff that matches well for the end game victory point conditions that you personally have, but what that means is, uh, when we played this game, there were uh, people doing very very different things. Uh, the person who I believe won, I believe it was Claire, uh, she went crazy on prospecting and ended the game with like four wagons fully loaded with gold because she just kept doing prospecting actions. Now I'm pretty sure she had equipment that made it so that when she did prospecting actions she got to do other stuff and I think she also had equipment that let her get uh, gold when she did other different types of actions so it was a good synergy type thing. Whereas we had another player, um, I believe um, Matt had almost no wagons at the end of the game but um, he had a ton of these townsfolk and I believe he was actually 
relatively close in the score um, there. Now, I did not do very well. I think I went a little bit too broad with my approach, and I didn't really hone down, down on any one strategy, but I still really enjoyed the game, even though I think I came dead last. And it is also worth mentioning that this game comes with asymmetric starts that you can have for each one of the players, and we definitely played with those. And they're pretty different. Uh, like, the abilities that you have are going to be significantly different than your opponents, and that's definitely something that you can try to uh, work around as you're developing a strategy for the game. Now, the only um, issue, that I suppose, that I had with the game was the overall length. Um, mechanically, this is a very breezy dice drafting game. Like, there aren't that many rules. But our four-player game took... Over two hours, I think. Now, uh, part of that you can definitely uh, blame us for. You know, we were just doing a bit of <laughs> analysis paralysis as we were crunching through all the options. And, you know, we're at a five-day board gaming uh, frenzy type thing, so you're not as concerned about, like, trying to rush along the game. But it did seem like the uh, middle part of the game really dragged quite a bit. But then we, once we got to the uh, last week or so, we breezed right through it. I think we all kind of finally clicked into the things that we were looking for. And I think a second play of this one with the same four people would likely have been significantly less time. And I'm hoping it will be because I am hoping to play this one again. I really enjoy dice drafting style games. And this one did a great job of uh, doing that out on the table. And uh, hopefully it won't continue to be a little bit longer than I'm uh, wanting it to be. But I'm hoping to have a chance to experiment with that in the future. Next up, we have the 15th game that I learned at the convention, and this one is Raccoon Tycoon. Now, I don't think I had heard about this one going into the convention, but we were, I think, in the last day of the con, and one of my friends came up, uh, and he was just like, I want to try this game. It has this adorable art on it with all these little fuzzy uh, woodland creatures and whatnot, and he also said that this was a commodities trading auction style game, and I'm not usually crazy about uh, commodities trading and auction style games, but the box said it would be like 45 minutes or so, and the art was amazing, and he really wanted to try it, and that's what um, conventions like this are all about. You don't necessarily want to just play games you know that you're going to like. You also want to um, expand your horizons and try things that your friends, uh, like Dave in this instance, were really excited to try. So uh, we sat down to play this one, and he taught the rules, and it's a really simple game. Um, you have these uh, cards that you will uh, get a hand of, and on your turn, you can do um, a, uh, two different things, I'm pretty sure if I'm remembering correctly, but one of the main things that you will be doing is you will be playing one of these cards down. Um, you don't have to every turn, but this is one of the options that you do. And on the bottom of this card are a variety of resources that you can gather. Now, there might be more resources there than you have the ability to actually take. I believe at the start of the game, you can only take like three, even though there might be like five on this card. So you have to pick and choose which resources you want, and you put them into your area. But then at the top of this card, it also shows other icons which might match some of the resources you just took. And out in the middle of the board, you have these tracks, and you will move all of the associated tracks up, essentially making all of those resources more valuable. So you are obviously trying to play cards that will let you get resources that are valuable, but by doing that, you are increasing the value of those um, resources, and then other people might, on their turn, choose to sell the resources instead of playing a card. Now, if they sell the resources, then they simply look to the track, and they see how much um, that specific resource is in that moment. And then, you know, if it says, you know, it's um, the bricks are worth seven or something like that, and they have three bricks, then they do seven times three, they take 21 money. But since they sold three bricks, then you move the track down three times. So it is now less lucrative for other people. So right off the bat, I was actually pretty intrigued by this. It seemed like a really clean system for having, um, you know, the uh, prices fluctuate up and down. There are a lot of different resources that you are trying to gather. And then the kind of end game state for this uh, game is you're trying to uh, vie for these auctions to pick up these uh, railroad tycoon cards as well as these building cards to kind of like match along with the uh, the tycoon cards. And then the other thing you can pick up are um, other cards that give you synergistic bonuses. Um, effectively, there are uh, set collection victory point railroads, there are non-set collection um, houses, I suppose, and then these buildings with these benefits that um, range in a wide, surprisingly uh, diverse way. So at the start of the game, we looked out to the building types and it was like, like, when you take this resource, take one more of that resource. Or when you take resources, take one more resource total. And those things seemed, you know, pretty good. And so we started buying these cards uh, with our money that we are, of course, getting through selling our resources and the market is fluctuating around. Um, but then we pretty soon found that some of the new buildings that were coming out did pretty wacky things. Like one of them said that whenever an auction happens, the person with this building just gets five money, which is a reasonable amount of money. I mean, um, some of the auctions uh, will be going for like 50 or 60 money, but five money is not insignificant. And um, there are were other buildings that uh, made it so that every time certain things happen, 
happened. Other people got a bunch of stuff. I honestly can't remember all of the specifics, but I do remember that many of them, as they came out, were like, whoa, I can't believe that's in the game. Like, that's a pretty crazy ability. Now, I've alluded to the idea of auctions, so I should talk about that briefly. The last thing that you can do on your turn, instead of uh, taking uh, resources or selling them, is you can start an auction for one of those railroads. And you uh, effectively just start the bid off, and then it just goes around the table until everybody passes, and then one person spends the money to take that uh, railroad card. And the more of the specific type of railroad card that you have, the more money that card will be worth. So you are obviously gunning to try and make sets, but that also means that certain railroads are worth more to you than they are to your opponents. So um, once you get into the middle stages of the game, you find yourself in auction situations where one person really wants that card and other people don't necessarily want it as much, but they are trying to bid up the auction so that the person who really wants it pays more for it. But that person, maybe if they push too far and um, makes the first person say, you know what, it's not worth it to me, then that person just spent a humongous amount of money for a card that really is not going to do very much for them. Uh, this uh, kind of spoiler mechanic, I can see on paper making sense. But as we started playing the game, we kept having these situations where people felt like almost guilted into increasing the bid up more and then being really worried that they might actually take, the, take it. And I know that many auction games have that tension, but the way the set collection ramped up, it really didn't feel great when you were trying to uh, make somebody who seemed like they were winning um, spend a little bit more money and then they tap out and then you get this card and you just spent so much money and you feel like, you know, sure, you stopped maybe the person you think is uh, winning from doing as well, but everybody else is super happy that you just biffed. And I know that auction games can be very um, mean in this respect, and somebody, uh, some people love that, but for us, we were not as crazy about that aspect of the auction in this game. And I have to mention uh, one moment that happened in this game that was really peculiar. Now, I mentioned that one thing you can do on your turn is you can start an auction. And if you don't win that auction and it's your turn, then you will um, get to take another turn, essentially. Like, you, um, if you start the auction and somebody else takes it, then it comes back to you and you get to take another turn. So what happened is uh, the player, uh, Matt, in this case, who took the card that give, gave him five money every time an auction happened, it got to his point, uh, his turn at one point, and lots of people had a bunch of money, and he just started doing auctions, and he kept intentionally not taking, uh, not winning those auctions. So he would start an auction, it would go, and then he would start another auction, and another auction, and another auction, and another auction, and I swear, we probably did 25 minutes straight auctions. It must have been like, I don't know, 15 auctions or something crazy. And I think part of this was us not being super familiar with the game. Obviously, we were hoarding money to be able to have that many auctions uh, take place. But um, uh, and in that moment, it kind of like liquidated out all of our cash as this was happening. And in every single one of these auctions, Matt was gaining five money. So like it kept happening, gave five money. It kept happening, gained five money. And then at the end of this, he finally won one of these things when he had a mountain of cash and everybody else was completely tapped out. And then the next, and then the next many several turns, it kept coming back to him, and he kept starting auctions and winning them pretty easily because he had way more money than the rest of us did. Now, I think he definitely played the game well for that mechanic, but in that moment, we were honestly asking, like, are we screwing up a rule here? Like, this feels almost like a degenerate um, situation. <laughs> like, it got a bit ridiculous as we kept doing auction after auction after auction. Essentially, this like um, uh, intermission in the middle of the game to have this crazy amount of auctions and then go right back to it. Now, I don't think that's necessarily a negative to the game. I do think that maybe we were just hoarding too much money to have the um, pressure then be released in this strange way. But it's also worth noting that if, uh, you know, that card had been uh, deeper in the shuffle, then that situation may not have actually even happened in the game. Like, it was this, this strange moment that's not guaranteed to happen in every, uh, every one of these games. And overall, it left a bad feeling, a uh, bad taste in several of the players' mouths. Now, the biggest issue, I suppose, with the game is that it went pretty long. Uh, we were expecting this to be like a 45 to, minute to an hour long game, and it probably went close to two hours with our... I believe we were playing with five players, which is the um, biggest uh, player count. Now, oftentimes, it's not a good idea to play a game at the uh, highest player count, but uh, this one is definitely one of those cases. And it just, we went away from the game feeling like if it had actually been a 45-minute game, then we would have all probably really enjoyed it because of the uh, really neat uh, engine of um, playing cards to gain resources and make everything go up. It seemed like it had a lot of clean, neat ideas going on with uh, also um, the most adorable fuzzy artwork with all of these different cards. But it just seemed like the buildings weren't necessarily super balanced, and it just seemed like the game went a lot longer than we were hoping it would. So overall, I was pretty disappointed with the experience, and I feel like there could have been a really great uh, game in here, but we didn't necessarily see it. 
Let's now move on to game number 16, which is Realm of Sand. Now, this is one of the new releases that came out from Emperor S4. And I have um, an interesting history with this game, I suppose, because I played an early prototype of this back in March of this year. Uh, that was at the Gamma Trade Show. And at that point, uh, the prototype used little Lego pieces and it didn't have a name or necessarily a theme at that point. And now we have this um, fully published game. And so I was really excited to try it because I really enjoyed playing the prototype back in March. In fact, we played it a couple times in a row. We enjoyed it so much. Now, what's going on mechanically in this game is you have a ring of these uh, little um, polyomino shaped uh, tiles in the middle of the table, and then everybody has their own player board. And what you are going to do on your turn is everybody has a couple of these shapes in their hand as well, and they are going to take one of these shapes, and they have um, one, two, or three of the three colors in the, uh, the base colors in the game, and you will match it up to a spot on your board, and then take resources that match those colors and plunk them down in the exact pattern of the tile that you just put, and then you take that tile and you put it back into this um, chain of tiles in the middle of the table. Um, at the end of your turn, you will then take a new tile from the start of the chain from one of the first two options, I think, and you add that into your hand of three, and then you keep going on with the game. So effectively, you are drafting these templates that you then use to put these colored um, single tiles down into your area. And what you're trying to do is match up patterns that uh, correlate with these cards that are in the middle of the table. Now, I joked that this game uh, should have been called Splatchwork because it has a um, uh, Splendor type thing going on here with the cards in the middle of the table. And it has a Patchwork type thing going on with this ring of uh, different shapes that you use to build out these um, patterns in your area. Now, from a Splendor um, angle, what you are doing on your turn is if you are able to match up the pattern with one of the cards in the middle of the table, then you get to take that card and then you remove all the tiles from your player area that match that card. So they're essentially, I guess, sanding away, you know, drifting away. You're in the realm of sand as you're kind of building these buildings and they ebb and flow. The theming is beautiful, but I don't know if it necessarily makes sense. Uh, but the card that you just took will likely have victory points on it. And it will also likely, especially in the earlier stages of the game, give you access to these little spirit tiles. And these spirit tiles match up some of the basic colors, but then also some of them match up with these harder to achieve colors. And then when it's your turn, you can either use one of these templates to put uh, some of these resources down, or if you have a bunch of these spirit um, um, uh, resources, you can then rush those onto your board instead. And they act just like the regular resources. But whenever you take a new card, then your spirits go back into your hand, and then you obviously get the card. So as you're playing the game, you are building an engine of these spirit tiles, which let you really flood them out um, in a freeform way that's not locked into one of the patterns, which will make it easier for you to make the larger and more complicated patterns. Now, the uh, bigger the pattern is, the more victory points it is, and the harder it is to achieve, the less bonuses it gives you. Like, there are three different layers of these patterns, which is very reminiscent to Splendor, and the last one with the most points gives you no specific resource bonuses at all. It just gives you a lot of points and points are obviously what you're gunning for. So uh, we played a four player game of this and um, when I played it uh, in its final form, I think it was probably like 80% or so similar to the uh, prototype that I played back in March. So not a lot had changed, and it's honestly hard to pinpoint exactly what maybe did change in any one way, but I will say that I enjoyed it in its final form, just like I did back in the prototype stages. It is a fun game to try and work together to figure out how you're going to make all these patterns work. I really enjoy that spatial puzzle. But um, at the same time, um, this game does come with some asymmetries that you can flip over your boards and play with, and we of course played with those because asymmetries are fun, and it was really hard to not find yourself thinking that some of these asymmetric powers seemed significantly better than other ones. Um, I think in the future, if I'm um, able to play this game again, um, at this point I don't have a copy of it, I don't think I'm going to play with the asymmetries. I don't think they do enough to really um, add to the gaming experience. I think playing with a, um, a blank slate, everybody in the same position at the start, is likely a better way to go as you are all vying to try and take all these different patterns. You're of course looking at what your opponents are working towards and trying to decide um, oh shoot, you know, they're going for the same card I am, will I be able to get there before them? If you don't think you will, then you should change up your plan and try to go after something else. Now, obviously, this game does not have the Splendor mechanism where you can reserve cards, and to a certain extent, I feel like maybe it should have had that mechanism, because there were definitely some times where it seemed like a player or two 
kept trying to vie for something and it would get taken at the last minute right before they could. And they'll try for something else that it gets taken right before they could. And that's definitely not a fun experience when that happens to you over and over again. And I don't think it necessarily broke the overall game, but I do think some sort of reservation system would have been a nice addition to the game. Although I suppose that would have made it even more similar to Splendor, which is maybe something they weren't necessarily going for. So either way, I think that this is a really neat little box. It's got some cool mechanics, some cool um, uh, mixing of mechanics that I've seen in different games in the past. It's a relatively small box, and I am, to a certain extent, kicking myself for not picking up a copy of this one at Essenspiel when I could have. Uh, I had the opportunity early in the show, and then I didn't. I was kind of going back and forth, and by the time I said, yeah, I want to go and get it, it was super sold out. So I know it will likely be coming out again in the future, because I think that in general people have been enjoying this one, so it'll hopefully get another print run. And I would like to have the opportunity to play this one again, and I think I'd like to have this one in my collection. It would take up a small um, uh, area on my bookshelf, on my game shelf, that is. And uh, yeah, it was a, a fun overall experience. I don't think it necessarily blew anyone away, but I would like to come back and revisit this one more. Next up, we have game number 17 that I played, and this one is Reef. Now, this one was published by Plan B Games, and it came out earlier this year. I think it either released at Origins or Gen Con, something like that. And this is a very lightweight puzzle-style game of building up a coral reef, and the designer of this game is Emerson Matsuchi, who also designed uh, both of the uh, Century games that have come out recently and a couple other games. Now, the mechanics of this game are really quite simple. Everybody will have a hand of cards, and on the top of the cards, they have these um, uh, reef tokens, uh, re resources that is, uh, that if they play that card, they will then take those resources and stack them up onto their reef. Now, as you can see in the photo, this is a um, really chunky, plasticky uh, piece type of reef that you're building up. It's um, quite nice, actually, to snap all these things in. It has a great toy factor. But um, on this card, you not only have a top part, but a bottom part. So after you play the card and add the associated pieces that are on the top, then you score the bottom part for that type of pattern that you can see in a bird's eye view looking out onto your overall reef that you're making. Now, um, there are no specific rules for the placement of these pieces. The only thing is you can't move any previously placed pieces because it's a coral reef and coral doesn't move once it grows onto a spot. So what you are doing on your turn is you are either going to draw a card from a face-up row in the middle of the table, or you are going to play a card and put these resources down and then score points. So that what that means is this is a very fast game where it's just like draw a card, boom, boom, draw a card, boom, boom play a card, do a couple things, and then while you're doing that, maybe your opponents draw a couple cards, and by the time you're done scoring your thing, it's suddenly your turn again. Uh, we played a three-player game of this one, and it was pretty common to have it be your turn again within 20 seconds or so of you uh, completing your last turn. So there are lots of quick turns, uh, because what you're trying to do is build up combos with these cards in your hand. Now, you're only allowed to hold, I believe it was a max of four cards in your hand, so you can't just keep drawing and then do that indefinitely. At a certain point, you will be forced to play a card down, and you're going to try to play these cards in an order so that you play this one to put these out here and maybe score a little bit, which sets you up really well to play this one down here to put these resources out and then score a lot, because with these uh, scoring objectives on the bottom of the cards, you can score them as many times as you meet that condition. So you're obviously going to try and meet that condition over and over again. Now, it's not always about the colors and patterns that you see. Sometimes it's about um, the adjacencies of certain colors to other colors. Um, many of them have something to do with the height of the specific piece of coral that you're building. And I have to admit that I found this to be a really fun experience. I went into it with moderate expectations, I suppose. You know, I knew that it was a very simple game. Uh, we read the rules in like two minutes or something like that. It was a very quick uh, rules read and then a super quick teach. Probably not actually two minutes to read, but you get the idea. Um, and I expected it to be fine and cute. And I really ended up enjoying the puzzling nature of trying to figure out the order in which you're going to be playing your cards and the way in which you're going to be putting these pieces out. Now, I have heard in the past when this game was first released, um, there was a bit of a big bang right then. And then I started hearing a trickle of disappointment, like people trying it and saying, ah, it's not actually that interesting. Um, and I think maybe there was a little bit of overhype for a little bit right there. And so by the time I got to try it, I went into it knowing that many people were disappointed in it and many people liked it a lot. And so I tried it out and I'm really happy to say that I'm more on the liked it a lot side of things. Um, it's obviously not a super deep game and we played our three player game I don't know, probably like 30 minutes or so, maybe, maybe 40, maybe actually less than 30. It's hard to tell because this game was so rapid fire that we're just constantly thinking and going and thinking and going. I'm not even sure exactly how much time it took. Now, uh, one criticism I suppose you could level at this game is that it's 
pretty much multiplayer solitaire. Now, as you are drawing the cards, you are taking them from the middle of the table, so you could draw a card that your opponent wants, but you are so caught up with the patterns and the plans that you are building up with the uh, coral reef you have in front of yourself, you are not going to be looking across the table and being like, ooh, I think they really want this card, I'm going to take it so they can't take it. Instead, you're just going to take the cards that work best for the thing that you are doing, and so you're effectively kind of all doing your own thing, staring at your own coral reef the entire time, not really paying attention to what your opponents are doing, and at the end of the game, you see who is able to um, figure your way through this puzzle better. Now, I don't mind multiplayer solitaire games, and I think that's um, one of the reasons why I land on the enjoyed it side of things for this game. And honestly, I would very much like to play this game more. I think for the rules overhead that goes into playing this game and the amount of thinkiness that went into the turns that I was playing, but also at the same time, not pushing myself into too much analysis paralysis, I think it's a really good mixture of all those things. And I would like to play this one more. I don't have a copy of it, but I hope to have the opportunity to uh, check this one out more. I think it is probably a really good um, beginning, middle, or end of game night filler type situation, especially if you have maybe two or three people waiting for other people to finish a game. Um, if everybody, especially if they know this game already, they could probably slam out a game of this in, like I said, under 30 minutes, which means um, that might plan out really well for that Euro game that is just starting to wrap up and it's in that, you know, three quarters to being over a stage of things. So overall, I was pretty impressed by Reef, and as I've said many times now, I would like to try it again. Let's now move on to game number 18, and this one is Rayholt. Now, this one was recently published by Renegade Games. I think it came out just um, a month or two ago at Essen Spiel, and the designer of this game is Uwe Rosenberg, who has designed a ton of different games. Uh, you have Bonanza, Agricola, Caverna, A Feast for Odin, and At the Gates of Loyang as one particular example, and the reason I bring that one up is because Rayholt is um, the designer coming back to revisit one of his previous designs, in this case being At the Gates of Loyang. Now, in both of these games, now, I have not played <laughs> Lo Yang at this point, but my understanding is in both of these games, they have a similar farming mechanic where you will gather plots of land and then you will seed that plot of land with a resource that you have already harvested, like a tomato, for instance. And when you seed it onto that land, you then fill the rest of the uh, area in that land with tomatoes. And then at the end of every turn, you get to harvest one thing from every one of your plots. And there are other ways to harvest more resources. And then you use these resources to do some stuff. Now, in both of these games, you have that farming mechanic. But um, Rayholt is a worker placement game. And I do not believe that at the gates of Loyang was. Now, uh, coming back to Rayholt, the worker placement mechanics are very straightforward. There is nothing particularly new here. Uh, every person has three workers. You always have three workers while you're playing. And you put the worker onto a spot and then evaluate the location. Um, if somebody's gone there already, you can't go onto that spot, so you have to choose a different one. And there is a small restriction with these flags for uh, putting two workers down in the same column, but for the most part, you can do um, a lot of different options on this um, somewhat uh, moderately large board of uh, worker placement spots. Now. As you are playing through this game, uh, the spots will let you get new plots of land, seed the land, harvest the land, get resources through other different ways. Um, there are also ways to um, get these uh, bonus cards. Now, these bonus cards are kind of uh, mirrored on them with these effects. And in a four-player game in particular, when you take one of these cards, you put it in front of yourself, and you now have that ongoing ability for the rest of the game, unless maybe it's a one-shot ability. Now, there's this kind of neat idea where somebody can go to one spot on the board, which actually forces a sharing of that card. And they can only do that if they are adjacent, like sitting around the table to that person. So you then move that card in between the two people, and now they both have access to that card. Now, there's only one spot on the entire worker placement board that lets you draft these cards. And if I I'm being honest, in the first round of the game, I kind of forgot that it was an option, and uh, my friend Matt picked up the first one, and then we, you know, moved the starting player token over, and then I think Matt was the next starting player, and so he started off by taking another one of those cards, and then Jessica was next to him, and she took the thing to share with him, and it seemed like the way the turn order worked and me just kind of missing my first opportunity to grab one of these benefit cards, because I honestly just forgot about it, because there's a lot of options, meant that all of the really good card actions were taken by the time I could get there. And since Matt was across the table from me, I didn't even have a chance to share those cards with him. So that meant that um, Jessica and Claire were sharing those cards. And in a particular, Jessica was doing it because we play clockwise. So Matt would take a card and then Jessica would share it. And then I didn't have a chance to even get access to it and Claire didn't either, which was a little bit strange. And they were able to get a really nice combo going where one card did something when they harvested, it let them take a thing. And then another card said when they take a thing, they get to do another thing, which was a really nice combo. 
Now, that's not a super criticism. I think I passed up on my opportunity to grab that, but it did feel, uh, leave me feeling a little bit bummed. Like I just felt like I had, you know, whiffed at something once and then never had a chance to even swing at that ball again for the rest of the game, which I don't necessarily love. But either way, we're playing through the game, uh, building these combos, and this game has a very strange scoring track. It goes around the outside of the board, and at the start of the game, you, um, in order to move up on the score track, you simply discard one of a certain type of vegetable, and they start with the least valuable and go to the most valuable. Once you go through those six different steps, then you have to do two of the vegetables going through, and then three, and then four, and then five. So at the beginning of the game, at the end of every round, everybody can cash in resources to race up this uh, victory point track, and you can race really far in the first couple rounds of the game, but by the time you get to the end of the game, you are having to spend like three tomatoes or, you know, uh, four cauliflower or something like that, and it can be really hard to get those uh, together, and there are worker placement spots that let you just discard your farms entirely, just throwing everything away to just move forward one more time on that track. Now, overall, I think the game was fine. I think everybody enjoyed the experience um, for the most part. Um, I think from a worker placement game perspective, I don't necessarily feel super interested in hunting this one down again to play it again. It was a fine experience, but I was, to a certain extent, overwhelmed by all of the iconography on this board. And I know that sounds silly because I love A Feast for Odin, which has like four times as many worker placement action spots on it as a Rayholt. But also, in A Feast for Odin, the actions were very well organized. So if you wanted to do a specific thing, you would look to that one area and then do that one thing. Whereas in Rayholt, I kept forgetting about action spots because it seemed like they were kind of scattered all over the place. Like, the, the, it might be hard to organize them, considering so many of them do different things, but the way it was organized did not really click with my brain, and there were lots of times where I would do a turn, and then my opponent would do something, and I'd be like, oh my gosh, I totally forgot that was even an option. I didn't even see it over there because I was looking at this other thing over here, and, you know, that's my fault. I blame myself for that, but it still happened a few times for me and some other players, and it, it just ended up leaving me feeling a bit take it or leave it with the game overall. Um, if somebody uh, showed up with Ray Colt and said, I want to play this game again, then I think I would, without much hesitation, say, yeah, sure, let's give it a shot, and I'm going to see if I can do better next time. But um, the way it all came together didn't necessarily uh, enamor me overall, so I wouldn't mind playing this again in the future, but I I'm fine with never revisiting it. Let's now move on to the 19th new game that I played at this convention, and that one is Sailblazer. Now, I did know about this game going into the convention. In fact, I kept telling people <laughs> at BoardGameGeekCon before I played this that this was my going to be my guilty pleasure game of the convention because I wanted to play it. It was going to happen. I was going to force it to happen, and I was pretty sure it was going to be a bad game. <laughs> now, the reason I say this is because I first heard about this game when I saw it on the Essen Spiel massive list of new games that came out at Spiel, and I remember seeing Sailblazer, and it had like a ship with a person leaning off the ship on the cover, and I thought, that looked kind of cool. So I clicked on it, and they had the rules posted, so I read the rules. And I just remember walking away from the rules thinking, this game could be really fun, and it could also be really awful. <laughs> this is a kind of sandbox-style game where you are just sailing out with your ship, um, exploring new tiles out on the ocean, and those new tiles might give you um, uh, adventure stuff that'll happen. It might have you run into pirates that you then roll dice at to try and defeat, and if you miss, then you have bad things happen to you. Um, you also do a bit of um, commodity gathering and uh, buying and selling. You can, like, buy uh, commodities and then try to sail far away from where they get sold and then sell them to get a bunch of money, and then you can spend money to... Um, buy sailors and then add them, uh, hire sailors, I suppose, and add them to your ship and get different upgrades. You get experience for doing all of these different things. And as you level up, you can get more guns and more uh, space on your uh, your ship. And so it just looked like this kind of silly adventure at high seas type of game. And I had to give it a shot. So I think on the third night of the convention, I got to sit down with four people, uh, three other people, that is. And I, I mentioned that. I said, you know, this game is probably going to be bad, but I hope that it's going to be fun. And I am happy to say that I was totally right. <laughs> this game was an absolute blast to play, and I don't think I ever want to play it again. <laughs> so uh, let's go into the specifics of why. Now, um, at the start of the game, everybody has dealt out a prologue card, and they can kind of read it to either to their opponents or by themselves, and it kind of tells you what your story is, like what you're um, trying to do, like why are you out at the high seas trying to do all these different things. Um, and it also gives you a nickname, and 
I really, I can't remember the nicknames off the top of my head, but they were funny. And so we're like all telling each other, like, ah, my nickname is, you know, Slippery Seal, I think was one of them. And, you know, that kind of thing. One of them was Usurper, I think. Uh, and so then you start going out, and in order to complete your prologue card, you have to explore a specific location out on the map. And once you go there, then you get to draw a new card from your specific storyline um, that's very specific to kind of keep going your prologue. So you go from your prologue to your next card. Like if I have the A prologue, then I draw, you know, the A2 card to kind of keep myself going. And then that gives you a little bit more breadcrumbs about your story. And then it has an end game condition. Like if the, if you do the certain thing at the end of the game, then I think when the game is over, read epilogue one. If you do this other thing, then read epilogue two. If you do the third thing, then do epilogue three. So as you're playing the game, doing all these different things and getting prestige for um, doing all of these different things, you are also trying to chase down this storyline, which were in general funny and ridiculous. Now, another thing that you can do on your turn is there are these cards that you can kind of capture um, on every one of your turns if you do certain conditions. And it, it, the game, it's the game kind of forcing you to try different things. Like one of them was, you know, fight off um, uh, seagulls. And if you, um, well, you get a benefit if you fight off seagulls on that turn. Another one might give you a big benefit if you go fishing on this turn. And those benefits are oftentimes extra resources or prestige points. They get lots of prestige points for fighting pirates. And so as we're playing this game, there are a lot of pirates that you bump into as you are exploring new tiles. And I kept failing. Like I was just awful at fighting these pirates. I would just roll the die and roll the worst possible uh, number. There are ways to like spend rum and then also fire off your cannons to get bonuses, but I kept missing. And if I was playing this game seriously, then I would have gotten really frustrated. But I wasn't playing this game seriously. I came into it being like, you know, I'm the slippery seal and let's see what we can do with this thing that we're doing. And it was, you know, when I'd roll the die and I'd roll a one again, I mean, we all just burst out laughing. Like we were just in that correct mindset, I think, to play this game as just, I was just the worst person at fighting pirates. But then my friend Chow Yu was just master slaughterer of pirates. He just was decimating the seas, just wiping out these uh, pirates like crazy. And uh, so overall, we're just having fun, exploring, uh, getting through our epilogues, having awful things happen to me. I just had the worst luck over and over again. I draw events and it's like, ah, you're trapped in a whirlpool. And I draw another one and like, ah, you're stuck at sea. And, you know, just various things. While well, my opponents kept getting these really great benefits. And we were just laughing the whole way through. I mean, just really wonderful moments as we're playing this game. Now, when the game was uh, finally over, there was, um, I, I was going after my epilogue and a very specific condition if I was able to um, go to the treasure island, which is one of the ways the game ends, so you find treasure island. And if I was able to have a treasure map in that moment, then I would have gotten a lot of prestige. And so I knew it was a Hail Mary and I kind of went after that and I was one turn away from it. I missed it again because I'm just the most unlucky person at this game. And uh, my friend Chow Yu, I think, who was already dominating, was able to actually get this. And um, he won the game by a landslide with his prestige points, but then we, of course, read through our epilogues at the end. Now, he read his epilogue and it was like, you are amazing. You have, you know, um, achieved all the glory you wanted. You know, your trade company is now huge. You are now, you know, have the official title nickname of Sailblazer. And it was like, oh, okay, that was cool. And then we came to mine. And it was like, you, all of your hopes are dashed. The wind has stopped blowing on the sea. You are now just dead in the water and you are probably just going to die there as the most miserable person ever. And it, I just, I laughed so hard. Uh, and honestly, it was just such a funny way. Like it really told the story. Like I was awful at this game. In the very end, my epilogue card said, you were awful and now you're just going to die at sea and you're horrible. And so, yeah, at the end of the day, I think this game tried to be kind of sandboxy and have like interesting mechanics of like buying and selling different things and fighting pirates while also being a kind of storytelling type of game. And it went right between those two things and it didn't do either well enough. And the reason I say that is because while the storytelling stuff was fun and we were laughing and having a really fun time, that's it. Like there are only four prologue to middle to epilogue sets. And um, the mechanics of actually um, trying to like buy stuff for low and sell them for high and like do all that kind of um, other stuff to get prestige was not fleshed out well enough and way too random to actually make sense. So I feel like at the end of the day, this game should have either veered hard to one side and been like a serious sandbox style game with less randomness and more decisions or veered way to the other side, said, don't worry about all those mechanics and just have this be a um, storytelling game at the high seas. Um, honestly, we walked away from this game thinking like, man, I wish that this had been Tales of the Arabian Nights on the ocean, you know, with just like a huge um, book of different options and storylines that you could fl follow down because the moments that they made were so great. And so overall, I guess 
I've just spoiled one of the four things um, somewhat significantly, so I apologize for that, I guess. But uh, at the same time, I'm not really advising people hunt this one out and buy it because it's got one good play in it, and then you're just not going to want to come back to it. So hopefully, this inspires somebody else to make that Tales of Arabian Nights on the ocean style game so that we can get back to the laughing, fun, ridiculous nature of this game as you're fighting pirates and failing and getting sucked into whirlpools um, and uh, make it really focused on that because I think if there was a game out there where it would give you that feeling game after game, then I'll be all about that, and I would love to keep playing it. All right, let's now move on to the 20th game that I played, and this one is Scorpius Freighter. Now, this one was recently published by AEG Games, and there are two designers on this. Uh, one is Matthew Dunstan, who was part of the team that did Elysium, as well as Pioneer Days, which I talked about earlier on in this vlog, and I liked. And then David Short has designed a bunch of games as well. Uh, one that I've played and liked was Automobiles. Now, when it comes to Scorpius Freighter, I I was actively hoping to play this one at Board Game Geek Con because I had um, heard varying things about it. I remember the first uh, pictures I saw and feedback I saw on Twitter was, oh, it's just another Euro game, you're just gathering resources, you're just getting cubes and spending cubes, whatever, there's nothing new here. And I remember seeing that thinking, oh, that's a bummer. And I just moved on. Um, but then I saw another person um, uh, talking on Twitter uh, saying that they, they just loved this game and that they had come back to it like four times now and every single time they played it, it was brilliant and different. And I said, wait a second, what's going on here? <laughs> so I decided to look into it a little bit more and I read the rules. And after that, I was like, okay, I definitely have to try this game to see if it actually works. So I'm burying the lead a little bit here. Let's talk about the mechanics. Now in the Scorpius Freighter, everyone has a freighter ship and that is displayed by this little board in front of yourself, a little multi-layered board where you can slot um, these tiles into it. And as you are playing the game, you are going to be getting new storage tiles that you put into your area, as well as new pieces of equipment to put into your area. And you can store different colored cubes on the storage tiles, and you can get rid of them later on in the game to get points. And then the equipment can let you do various things. Now, the way that this game mechanically works is a little bit strange. Now, everybody starts the game with these four crew, and those are the only crew you'll have all game long, and you put them face up on the table underneath your player board, and there's like, you know, crew and pilot and captain, but it doesn't matter which one's which, that's all um, just theme. And when it's your turn, you tuck one or two of these crew up underneath your board, and then you will move a rondel one or two spaces forward. Now, in the middle of the table, there's this board with three different rondels, and everybody's kind of working with these neutral um, figures on these rondels, so you're all moving the same specific pieces. And uh, one rondel is the one that allows you to move to spots and get new tiles to put onto your ship. The middle rondel lets you activate those tiles. So, um, you know, you actually put stuff into your storage containers or you activate those equipment tiles to do various things. And the last rondel is the one that lets you get rid of your cubes as resources in order to complete side deals and contracts in order to get a lot of points. So that's kind of the flow of the game. You have a rondel to get, um, to build an engine, a rondel to run your engine, and a rondel to cash out your engine. Now, when it's your turn, you tuck one or two people in, and then when it comes back around to you, if you tuck two people last round to move one of these things twice on a rondel, then you only have two more crew left, and so maybe you tuck one of them, move one over, and then you activate that spot, because the other weird mechanic here is that after you tuck these people, you then move the figure over on that rondel, and then you evaluate that action based off of the number of hands you have left over. Hands are the icon showing on the crew that you have not tucked up onto your uh, ship yet. So that means if you have all four crew ready, and you tuck one of them, then you have three that are still ready, all showing hands, and then you move a token once over, and then you can evaluate that one with a power of three, because there are three hands showing. But that also means at the start of your turn, if you have two people tucked already and two people not, and you tuck one of them, and you move once, you just have one person left over, so you only get to do that action with an evaluation of one hand, which is going to have um, give you less options as you're trying to do it. Now, there are lots of different ways that you can modify this while you're playing the game. All of the crew have special powers, but you only have access to them if you go to a spot on the board that lets you spend money and flip them over and now gain access to that power. Now, in another thing that I wasn't expecting, all these powers are universal. You don't just get it when you tuck that crew in. The moment you flip that crew over, you just, you just always have that effect. So it really does not matter the order in which you put this crew down in front of you. But what it means is you can build different combos. Some of these powers will uh, make it so that you get extra hands when you do different uh, things. Uh, many of them will give you extra resources when you get certain other types of resources. And the game comes with seven of these sets of four crew. And so I played it, we just randomly dealt these out and we played the game and I, I had a really rough time teaching the rules to this one. Uh, it took me, 
more time than I'd like to admit to really wrap my head around it enough to teach it well. I was kind of learning things about the game while I was teaching it, even though I had already read the rules like two times at this point, because there are some unexpected things like the way the hands work and the way the tucking works and the way the rondelles work. None of it was super familiar, and so what actually ended up happening is once we got into the middle stages of the game and we were really going, it really clicked, and I was like, this is cool. Like, this is doing stuff that I am not used to. It felt uh, fresh in a lot of different ways, and I think that's part of the reason I stumbled a bit on um, learning the game and teaching it that first time. Now, a big thing that you're trying to do is, um, with the tiles that you're putting into your freighter, the adjacency of these tiles really matters. You want to um, put the different colored container types next to each other because when you fill your containers, you fill all of the adjacent uh, containers of specific colors. Also, those equipment tiles, many of them deal with adjacency, like you might put an uh, equipment tile down next to a couple of containers and it says, fill up to two of the containers that are adjacent to this tile up all the way. So you have this um, tile laying puzzle as you're trying to build an, well, actually more like a tile laying engine the engine of where you put these tiles down in front of you will really start to kick off once you get into the middle stages of the game and you're just making lots of cubes and you're cashing them out for side quests and the game ends once the rondelles go around a certain number of times. Now, when the game ended, um, I was pretty high on it. I lost, I think. Um, I, I certainly did not win that game. And I was like, man, that was really interesting. I want to play this game again and try it correctly from the very beginning. And um, the overall mood of the table was all four of us liked it at the end. But I have to admit that about a third of the way, quarter way through the game, two of the people at the table were really disliking it. So that means, and I think a big part of that is because I taught it very poorly and we were, I was just stumbling over myself trying to figure out how these things work together. And so what that means is I was kind of enjoying it the whole way and two people actively disliked this game about a quarter of the way through it. And when the game was finally over, they were like, yeah, actually that was fun. I think I want to try this one again. So it really won uh, everyone back with the stuff that was going on there. And I was actually fortunate enough, I, I reached out to AEG after the convention and they sent me a copy already and I've been able to play it again. Um, that was a three player game. Uh, I played it with Jessica who was part of that first game. So it was her second play as well. And she was one of the people who was really not liking it and then ended up thinking it was pretty good by the end of that first play. We got to play a full three player game of it and it was, it was great, honestly. I really enjoyed that second play. I taught the rules very quickly now that I understood it. In fact, I remember after I finished teaching the rules, uh, Jessica commented, she's like, oh, this, yeah, this game is way simpler than I even remember. I just remember it being really complicated and hard to understand because I taught it so poorly. But when I taught it well, it was like, oh no, this is very streamlined and it just all kind of clicks together. So overall, I've been really impressed with Scorpius Freighter. I'm, I'm quite happy that I have this copy because I am going to come back to this one. I am going to be uh, playing this one more, uh, teaching it to more of my friends. Uh, there are advanced variants that you can play with, uh, with a little bit more asymmetry for the uh, starting cockpit tiles. Also, you have these seven sets of four crew, and there's an advanced variant where you just shuffle them all together, deal six out to everybody, and then do a hand draft where you grab one, pass five. Get the other five, grab one, pass four, and then once you have six at the end of this draft, you then choose four of them. So you can actually cultivate the powers of your crew as you're playing it. And honestly, I really want to try that. I think that there is a lot of depth to this game, and I am looking forward to delving into it and seeing what else it has to show me. Okay, let's now move on to game number 21, and this one is Shadows Amsterdam. Now, I first heard about this game before um, Essen. Uh, the uh, uh, publisher uh, reached out to me and said they wanted to um, uh, have me give it a shot, and they told me that it's, you know, kind of like a uh, Mysterium uh, Codenames type of real-time team game. And I, in general, do not like real-time games, and I kind of said, nah, I don't, I don't think I'm interested. And they, the, the representative said, I'm just like you. I don't like real-time games, but this game really won me over, and I remember thinking, yeah, but you're going to say that. You're trying to sell the game. Uh, so I wasn't too super interested in it. And then I got to BGG Con and a friend of mine checked this one out and they were setting it up and they asked me if I wanted to play. And I said, sure, let's go ahead and give it a try. So mechanically what's going on in this game is you have this field of hexes. And actually, if you're looking at that photo, we played it slightly wrong the first game. Uh, the very middle part of the board should also have a tile on it, but either way, we played it later uh, correctly. Uh, and what happens is you have two teams and on each team, there is a clue giver and they have a shield in front of themselves, and they have this hexagonal uh, clue tile, and it is just like code names. <laughs> so essentially, it's code names with hexes on this tile. It's hidden, and what is trying to show you is the different spots you want to get your team to move to on the city map. Now, your opponent has a matching tile, and some of the goal spots 
match for the both of us, and then some of them are specific to my color and some are specific to their color. And the goal of this game is you need to get your uh, team, as the clue giver, you need to give clues to your team so that they get to all of the checkpoints that they need to get to and then get to the exit before running into three policemen. If they run into three policemen, then the game is over. And the policemen are essentially assassin spots to a certain extent on the board, like locations that you don't want your people to go to. Now, at this point, it probably just sounds a lot like code names, but this is where it changes because it's also a lot like Mysterium in that you do not give vocal clues. Instead, the uh, two people giving clues have a face-up hand of, a face-up communal hand, that is, of 10 of these hexagon cards. Now, all these cards show different environments and situations with these anthropomorphized fuzzy animals doing various things. It's not really surreal, it's just kind of like stuff that would happen in a big city. Now, um, these cards are the same exact cards that uh, kind of match up with the uh, stuff that are out in the city. And so in order to try and get my team to move their pawn to the right spot, I look to this hand of uh, cards in my area, and I need to choose a card that I think matches up thematically with the spot that I want them to move onto. Now, the interesting mechanical catch here is I can give them one card, and that means you need to move one spot. Or I could give them two cards, which means they need to move two locations. They effectively jump over a spot. And if they jump over a policeman spot, that's totally fine. But that also means there is a lot more options that they have to pick from. But with two cards, you can kind of triangulate maybe the things that you're going for to make that clue better. Now, as I mentioned, this is a real-time game, and this is really how the game uh, clicks. And at this point, I think I should uh, spoil it that I really quite enjoyed this game, and I was not expecting to. I guess um, that uh, salesperson at the beginning of my little story here was right. Um, even though um, I don't like real-time games in general, this one really won me over. And I think that the stress level that was happening as you're playing this, like, 10-minute game was just wonderful. Now, from a clue-giver perspective, which I did, I think, twice, this game ended up getting played several times. From a clue-giver perspective, the fact that you have a shared hand of cards gives it this amazing um, thrill and tension because you might be looking out there and you're trying to take a card to, to pick on a different spot to get your um, team to go there before your opponent maybe grabs that card to have their team go to a different spot. Especially if you're trying to pick two cards to work together to jump them over to a location, you might have one card that you know you need and then you're just desperately trying to find the other one that matches up before your opponent maybe grabs that card to do something else. Now, since this is real time, that means your teammates, as you're giving them these clues, are also feverishly discussing, you know, what do you think goes here or there, and you don't have analysis paralysis problems because it's real time. You know, if you've ever played Mysterium, you'd probably recognize that this feels somewhat similar to that, but you could really talk forever about some of the uh, decisions that you have, like, in Mysterium, is it this, or is it that, or is it the other thing? Whereas in, in Shadows Amsterdam, your team kind of has to go with their gut instincts. You throw these two things down, and maybe they're like... There's a dominant red on both of these, and there's dominant red over here. Boom, we're going there. Or maybe you give them a card, and it's water, and they look over here. They're like, there's water here. Boom, we're going there. And oftentimes, they go in the wrong direction, which is definitely a bummer. But usually, it's only a problem when they go into a policeman spot, because, again, if you hit three of those, then you lose. Now, overall, um, like I said, I really enjoy the tension of this game. I enjoyed it from both sides. Um, you know, if we're coming back to the codenames um, comparison, I enjoy codenames, but I don't like being the clue giver because I just lock down trying to come up with clues. But in this game, you don't have to come up with creative clues. You just have these 10 cards and you just try to find similarities. You try to do it fast. Um, and you don't really worry about it if you make mistakes because it's just a fast, furious style game uh, of people just uh, constantly talking over each other. You know, the cards are getting thrown around like crazy. And um, I think within our greater group, this game got probably played like seven or eight times throughout the course of this convention. It got checked out a couple different times. And while I don't have a copy of it at this point, I would certainly play this game again. If I had a copy of this one, I do think I would bring it out Again, it's just a great filler. Um, just like Codenames, this game plays up to however many people you want. I think six is probably the best. So you have one clue giver and two people to talk amongst themselves to try and figure out uh, where you can go. But I think eight also worked fine when I saw that played. So yeah, overall, um, Shadows Amsterdam really impressed me. Uh, certainly, uh, I found it to be much more fun than I expected going in. And I'm hoping to have a chance to play it more in the future. Next up, we have game number 22, and this one is Silk. Now, I didn't know much about this game going into Board Game Geek Con. I had heard about it. I heard that it was a mean uh, spatial puzzle style game with these beautiful, um, big, chunky pieces of uh, wood that you are uh, moving around on the table, and that's kind of all I knew. Now, uh, at one point during the convention, I think on the second day, uh, my friend Matt came back from the library with this game. He had already read the rules to this because he was intrigued by it, so we sat down and we got to play a full four-player game. Now, what you're doing mechanically in this game is at the 
the start of every turn, you are going to put a little silk larva thing out onto the board. And this is a strange universe where the silk uh, worms are kind of like the size of sheep or something like that. <laughs> and they're grazing around and making silk for you and silk is victory points. And when you put these um, uh, worms out onto the board, you are trying to do it in such a way that you get them onto patches of land where they can eat a bunch of resources to then turn those resources into um, silk for you, which is victory points. Now, mechanically on your turn, you obviously put one of those out and then you roll two dice. Now, these are standard D6 dice and there are six different actions that you can take in the game and they are associated with all of those pips. So you roll the two dice and if you roll like a two and a five, then you put the two die next to the two action and the five die next to the five action and then you evaluate those in any order you want. Now, the game isn't purely random because you can always modify those dice as much as you want to by spending victory points. If you want um, that five to turn into a one, you can wrap around and spend two points to make it a six into a one and so you've spent two points to then do the action that you are wanting to do on that turn. Now, the actions involve doing things like placing fences out on the board, uh, putting hatcheries, which will um, allow you to put more of these worms out on the board. Uh, you also have a dog, like a sheep dog type thing that can chase around um, the um, silkworms. And you have yourself, like um, the shepherd, who can also uh, chase around the silkworms as well as the dog. And then finally, there's this non-player um, piece on the board. I think it's called the Okami. And it's kind of like a crazy um, wolf thing. And it just wants to eat your uh, silkworms. So the sheepdog can scare away the okami, uh, but the um, shepherd cannot. And so what you're trying to do in this game is place your silkworms down in different spots to harvest these locations, but then also move your dog and your uh, shepherd around to push other things around to try and squeeze your opponent's um, uh, worms into the okami so that they get eaten, and then they lose points for that at the end of the game. Now that's kind of the general preface and we're like, okay, so this game's probably gonna be mean and let's give it a shot. So we started playing it and a few turns in, we started to realize we were feeling really locked out. Um, we kept going back to the rules and reading through them the way the, um, the mechanics of the movement works. It seemed to imply that if you want to like move your sheepdog into a spot to scare away these silkworms, but there's no legal place to put those worms, then you can't actually move the dog. And um, that's not the case if you're on the edge, you can kind of push silkworms off the, the side of the board. But we found ourselves like four turns into the game feeling really locked down with the number of options that we had. And we just kept going back to the rules and reading through them again and like kind of working things through. And we kind of realized that there's, you can maybe like push things and have them swap places. But the spatial puzzle that this game promised ended up being just overall pretty frustrating. And I, I'm at this point, not super sure if we were playing it correctly. Um, I went back later on and read through the rules and still did not feel super confident that we were playing it correctly because it seemed like we were way overly locked down. And we did end up playing this full game, but by the end, we were kind of all rooting for the game to end because it was not really clicking for us. It was certainly not um, an, a fun overall experience. We were largely frustrated and it seemed like the promise of this uh, mean spatial puzzle um, really just ended up giving us this uh, very restrained thing, like we were all, you know, caught in nets, not really being able to do uh, much in the way of things that we wanted to do. Um, even the mean things, like you're like, oh, well, you know, maybe we're just being Care Bears and we're not do being mean to each other. We were definitely being mean. We were having all sorts of these uh, silkworms getting eaten, but even then it didn't seem like it was unlocking good turns for us. It was like, well, this is the thing that I can do, so I guess I will do it. So I think that's kind of all I have to say about Silk. Overall, it was pretty disappointing and I don't see myself coming back to it. Okay, let's now move on to game number 23, which is Selenia. Now, this is the most recent publication by Pearl Games. I think this one just came out at Essen Spiel a month or so ago. And this is a lightweight game of resource acquisition and uh, trying to spend those resources to get various bonuses. Now, when I say it like that, it doesn't sound very interesting, but if you look at the image here, I want to try and describe to you the really cool mechanic of this game. And that involves this uh, central neutral airship that is effectively flying around a uh, small planet and you are going from the day side which is obviously facing the sun and then through the night side and then through the day side again now the way this works is every time the airship moves forward you take the backmost tile you flip it over and then move it to the front and kind of scoot everything back down again now one of these tiles is the dusk slash dawn tile as it goes from day to night or night to day 
And when you flip that one over, that is going to be the edge effectively of the night day cycle as you have this airship racing around this globe. And I think it's a really good abstractification of that idea of going around the globe. Now, what you do on your turn is everybody has a hand of three cards and they all have a stack of, I believe it's 16 cards total and you shuffle them all up and you are just going to take 16 turns. Uh, when it's your turn, you play one card down and then you draw a card at the end of your turn. And all of these cards have a hole in the middle of it. Now, when you play these cards down, you put it out onto the map and you either put it next to the airship or adjacent to a card you've already played or you can pay resources in order to play that card farther away from the airship and your cards. But I missed that rule when we played the game. So our uh, first play has a pretty big asterisk. We were overly restricted as we placed all of our cards right next to the airship instead of really going way far out. But it was still fun, and um, I am hoping to try this one again, playing it correctly in the future. But either way, when you put a card down, you will see something in the window of that card, and the cards have numbers on them. Now, these numbers range from zero to, I think, three. And if there is like a piece of wood showing in the window and that hole in that card and the card you played is a two, then you take two wood from the supply and you put it down into your little storage area. Now you can only store a certain number of resources as you're playing. And so you obviously are trying to put these cards down in spots to get you the right resources that you need because there are locations that you can put cards down onto which will allow you to um, build these little uh, tokens by spending your resources and you slot them into your board. Now you can take the night tokens when you do, are in the night phase and you can take the day tokens when you're in the day phase. And um, you get victory points at the end of the game for um, whichever one of those you have taken less and you, of course, get points for those tokens as well. So you're trying to um, make all this stuff together to get the right resources. But also there's an extra mechanic where whenever you remove a tile and move it up to the front, flipping it over, every single card that was on that, um, that tile will then evaluate for the bottom bonus on that card. So every card has a number on the top, a window, and then a bonus on the bottom, which is effectively a leaving bonus. So by playing a card, you can chain together several different things. And by putting a card down, you can also see in the future when um, that card gets removed, you will get some more stuff. Now, the airship does not move every single turn. It only moves when somebody plays one of these zero cards down, and there are only so many of those in the deck. So as we were playing it, it seemed like um, there are a lot of zeros, <laughs> because obviously you need to race around this globe a bunch. But um, there were definitely moments where it seemed like we were racing forward, and then other moments where it seemed like we were really slow. Now, overall, the game, we played a four-player game, and I think it took us maybe 45, 50 minutes, and we all enjoyed it. Uh, we thought it was a neat, uh, fresh mechanism, this idea of this airship going around the planet. Obviously, the resource acquisition and set collection was, you know, pretty same old. Like you've definitely seen that a hundred times in games, but that's not the focus of this game. The focus of the game is that card play mechanic with the uh, cards with the holes in them and all that. And, um, and we all agreed that the game would definitely be better if we played it correctly, uh, allowing us to get rid of resources that we didn't necessarily need because there were many times where we felt glutted with resources that didn't match up with the things we needed. Uh, we would have loved to dump those resources to play cards farther away from the airship. So playing this game correctly, I think will even be more fun. And I have not had a chance to try it correctly uh, at this point, but I do hope to have an opportunity to do that in the future. Next up, we have game number 24, and this one is Trap Words. Now, this is the newest release from Czech Games Edition, and this is a team-based kind of party-style game um, that is somewhat similar to Taboo, if that makes sense. Because what you are doing in this game is you have, um, in every single round, uh, you're going to have one person on the team be a clue giver, and then everybody else will be trying to guess the clue. And what they do is they're going to have a card, and it has a specific uh, clue that they have to try and get their teammates to say. But before they can give clues, they have to give this card to their opposing team, and they will write out a number of trap words, which are effectively the uh, negative words that cause you to lose uh, if you're playing a game like Taboo or something like that. So it's very similar to Taboo, except your opposing team gets to choose which words are Taboo that you can't actually say. So obviously they're going to try to pick words that um, you are most obviously going to say to try and get your team to go over to that spot. And then what you do is you actually do this at the same time. So while they are trying to come up with the trap words for our clue, we are coming up with the trap words for their clue. And we're writing those all down on a sheet. And the way we played it is we just wrote like everything we could think of. And then um, once, you know, we were had to come up with a bunch of ideas, we picked our favorites and kind of slotted them up to the top. And then we each team evaluated this and they tried to get their teammates to guess 
that's the word. Now, there is a 30 second timer, I think. So that is the big restriction is you have to get them to guess in those 30 seconds. And you also can't say any of the words that your uh, opposing team picked. And if you do say any of those words, then boom, you just you know, lose that round and you don't move forward. Uh, because in this game, there is this track and you are um, kind of thematically in a dungeon. And if you do get your teammates to say the right word, then you move forward on this track. And that means you are closer to winning the game because um, the game ends as soon as one team, I guess, beats the last boss or something like that. Uh, but the farther you go in the dungeon, the more trap words your opposing team has available to themselves to give to you. So the better you are doing, the harder it will be to move forward um, later on in the future. And of course, if you keep um, uh, busting, then you stay on that same spot and you have the same number of trap words to go against. Now, there are locations that you go to along the uh, track that will actually make uh, events happen. And there's a, a decent sized deck, I think, of these events. And they can do a variety of different things. Um, one of them, probably the funniest one we bumped into, said everybody had to um, give clues like they were in an echoey cavern. So that means they had to talk, 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 like, like, this, 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 and, and make, make every, every word, word, echo, 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 which is obviously hard when you're trying to avoid what you think are obvious trap words. And then also you have, um, you know, a timer that you're going against. So that was cute and fun. And overall, I think that's how I would describe the game. It was cute and fun that there were uh, good moments, uh, people laughing, having a good time. Uh, um, at the same time, it was effectively taboo with better art and, you know, some event cards, <laughs> you know, and it was neat that we got to choose the taboo cards for the opposing team. So we felt uh, ownership when they busted. And we also felt ownership of a loss when they say that one word that we talked ourselves out of putting down as a trap word. So I think um, given the opportunity to play taboo or trap words, I would definitely play trap words. Um, but I think um, when it comes to um, team based, uh, especially timer based uh, party style games, I would probably be more interested in playing a game like Shadows of Amsterdam that I talked about earlier on in this uh, vlog. So yeah, overall, uh, Trap Words was fun, and I would not turn down playing it again in the future, but I don't think I'm going to necessarily seek it out. Let's now move on to game number 25, and this one is Treasure Island. Now, this is one of the newest releases from Matago Games, and this is a interesting deduction, fully competitive style game where um, you have a little bit of asymmetry. Now, we played a full five-player game of this one, and every time you play, you have one person who plays as Long John Silver, who um, plays a very different game than the rest of the people. But this is not a one versus many game because only one person can win. Now, uh, uh, thematically, what's happened here is Long John Silver has hidden their treasure somewhere out on this island. And then they have been locked up by the rest of us. We are his crew, I think, and we mutinied and locked him up. And now we are all trying to be the first person to find that treasure. And then we win if we're the only person to find that treasure. So the way the game works is for the first many rounds of the game, you have Long John as a character who is trapped up in this tower, and um, they are going to take an action in between everyone else's turn. So uh, one person takes their turn, and then Long John goes, and then another person, and then back to Long John. And the Long John uh, player's turn um, largely consists around of um, being forced to give various clues to everybody else um, that will allow them to have a better idea of where this treasure might be on the map. Because at the start of the game, the Long John player just writes a little X on this private little mini map that they have behind their screen. So they can pick anywhere on this island as long as it's not in the restricted zones. Now, uh, once I think you go through three cycles of this around the table, everybody taking three turns with Long John taking a turn in between, uh, the Long John player will actually break out of their prison. And now from that point on, you will have everybody go in player order with the Long John player only playing um, when it gets back to them around the table. And their game is really simple. They win if they were able to stall everybody else out to not find their treasure. And then when they break out, they just need to beeline over to the treasure and they need to be the first person to dig up their treasure. Now they obviously know where the treasure is, but nobody else does. So if you get to that point, then you obviously don't want to give it away too much uh, exactly where it is while you're trying to get over there. Now, when it comes to the actual player's turns, everybody has a couple different options. Um, they're um, pretty basic and they largely involve moving a certain amount of uh, space and then potentially doing a search. Now, when it's your turn, you can do a long move, and that means you just go really far, but then don't search. You can also do a short move and then do a search, or you can not move at all and do a large search. And when you do these, you take these templates and you put them on the map, and you get out dry erase markers, and you literally draw lines for the movement so you know where you are, and then you draw circles, and then you look to the long-down player and you say, is the treasure in this circle? And if it is, then you win. 
And if it isn't, then you don't win. And you've learned something about the game, and your opponents now know, uh, have a better idea of where that treasure might not be. But there are other things going on, where uh, every player has hidden clues that the Long John player was forced to give them at the start of the game. Um, there are also little bonuses that the Long John player can give out to people when they don't find treasure. And it's just a really strange uh, and novel deduction style experience of trying to find all this stuff and, um, you know, work obviously against your opponents, but also, you know, feeling a bit of that, like, um, futility of trying to find treasure, you know, you might have a decent idea, like it's over here, and you look to the Long John player and you say, would they just leave it right out in the open, assuming that nobody would check out in the open, and they would obviously check over there in that little alcove, and then you draw the circle and you look over, and it's not there, and you're like, ah, all right, and you go back to the next turn, um, but that huff is with a smile, like, it was definitely not frustrating, and um, overall, I quite enjoyed this play. Um, we did not reach the point where the Long John player got to break out, we were just about there, when uh, one of my opponents, unfortunately, found the treasure, and part of that was based off of the clues that they had, but also part of that was luck. I mean, they just happened uh, to have an idea that it was in this area, and they put the circle down, and it was right over there, so they won the game, and that's just part of the gaming experience. Now, I don't have a copy of this one, but I would really like to try this one again. Uh, it was a bit slow starting off. I think we were a bit rough on some of the rules, but um, if I played this one again, I would teach it uh, much quicker, and I think we would jump into it a little bit better. Also, it seemed like there was a bit of analysis paralysis happening, and for a game like this, where a lot of it is just like, going off of a hunch, I feel like, you know, maybe, you know, <laughs> talking people out of their analysis process a little bit would probably be better to uh, push the game along at a better uh, uh, pace. So yeah, I am hoping to try Treasure Island again at some point in the future. Uh, maybe I'll find a way to acquire a copy, or maybe not, but either way, it was a really cool experience, and I would like to see more of it. Well, we finally reached game number 26. This is the last new game that I played at Board Game Geek Con, and this one is Wildlands. Now, this is um, the most recent, I believe, release from Osprey Games, and the designer of this one is Martin Wallace. Now, he is a very prolific designer. He's made uh, lots of economic-style heavy Euro games. Um, he's done a few um, train-style uh, games, as well as um, some lighter stuff like uh, Via Nebula, and anyway, he's just done a lot of games. Um, but what's going on in Wildlands is you have a, a fighting style game, like almost a miniatures style game where um, each person has a team of these uh, people and you have this map out in the middle of the table and you are gonna be the first, uh, you are gonna win if you're the first person to gather up five gems or kill five people or some mixture of the both. You essentially need to be the first person to five points and every gem you collect is a point and every person you kill is gonna be a point. Now, the way the game works is it's a card-driven game where you draw these cards into your hand. And the cards uh, have a variety of different things on them. They say you can move, you can attack, you can defend, and that sort of thing. But they are associated with your faction and specifically with your five different people. So this card might say this one particular person can move or this um, these two other people can do an attack. And when it's your turn, you can play as many cards as you want to. So what you are doing is moving these people around uh, by playing these cards and you know exhausting the cards and losing them and trying to position yourself into good places so that you can um, harvest up these uh, gems, and you have to discard a certain number of symbols of that character to pick up the gems. I don't remember exactly how many, but it does mean you can't just run over there and grab it. You have to run over there and then also have even more cards for that specific character who's on that spot to pick up those gems. Now, uh, when it comes to combat, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, you play an attack card that says it does one damage. It will do one damage to the opponent unless they play a card that has the defend icon on it that's also matched up with the character that you are attacking. Now, at the end or beginning, I can't remember, uh, but anyway, at the uh, every single round, you'll be drawing up, I believe, two or three more cards from the top of your deck, which means you could play all of your cards out and then really kind of run out of gas and not have any options. Also, there are these interrupt cards, which get um, a little bit uh, crazy <laughs> to a certain extent because it might be my turn, but my opponents could play an interrupt card to just pause my turn and then they effectively get to take a full turn, but then someone else could pause their turn and then take their whole turn as well. So it's um, it, it's you're not always um, guaranteed to be able to do a certain number of things because you might have a plan and then your opponents will interrupt it. 
Now, uh, with the, the game that I played was just a two-player game. I played it with my friend Paul, and I enjoyed this experience. Now, in general, I'm not a fan of running around smacking people over the head with miniatures in a game. That's just, I'm more of a, you know, uh, independent, uh, sorry, indirect uh, interaction kind of Euro-style player. But this game had simple mechanics, and I wanted to give it a try. And I really did enjoy the hand management puzzle that this game gives you. Uh, do you want to just gas out and just, like, discard all of these cards? Well, maybe not, because now you have no cards in your hand, effectively and your opponents go and you have no way to defend yourself and they might do a bunch of damage and knock your people out. Now, uh, the game has a neat starting setup mechanic where um, every single uh, spot on the board has a number and each player is going to draw, um, I think twice, I think 10 cards. And what they will do is they will associate uh, one of these cards with each one of their people face down and that will be the starting location for that character. So you don't actually start the game with the people on the map. That's just going to be where they appear. And then you give the other cards to your opponent and those are going to be the locations where they put their crystals down. So you are dictating where you will start, but also where your opponent will be uh, putting their crystals. So you will obviously try to spread those out so that they can't easily grab a couple of those at the same time. Now, every single turn, you must reveal a new person, but you don't start with everybody out on the table. So that means for large parts of the game, there might be just like two, three, or four of these people running around. Someone gets knocked out, a new person comes in, and you can bring as many people out as you want to on your turn. But of course, they will be vulnerable if they're now out on the table. Now, I, like I said, I enjoyed this two-player game. I think it played pretty well at two players. Um, I would not mind trying this game at three or even four players because the map is the same size, and I think it would be a little bit less deterministic. Um, in a two-player game, you obviously don't know what's in their, your opponent's hand, but you know you win by getting to five before they do. You just look at that right away. But I think with three or even four people around the table, you will have situations where you know people start ganging up to bully somebody else down, and I think you will have um, characters who feel less safe um, having only two people playing. Uh, some of the characters were just so far away from their opponents, you just weren't worried about them getting smacked down. Now, the game actually ended with a pretty cool climax. I thought I had it in the bag, um, but based off the way I played my cards and the way my opponent played their cards, they played it just barely perfectly to squeeze a win out. And effectively, it was, um, if I kill their person, then they win, uh, then I win. And if they kill my person, then, then, um, then they will win. And those two people got into a fight, and it was just so close right there at the end with the cards we played. But my person ended up getting knocked out, and they ended up winning the game, and it was an enjoyable experience. Now, I don't think I'm going to hunt this one out. In fact, Osprey uh, Games um, reached out to me after this and asked me if I wanted a copy, and I, I declined. Um, I don't think this is the kind of game that I will be seeking to play all that often. Um, my wheelhouse, again, is, you know, Euro-style games, not really running around a dungeon trying to smack people over the head kind of games. So while I would like to play this one again, I am okay if I don't come back to it. I think it was a neat experience. I'm glad to have played it. Um, but I don't think I necessarily need to have a copy and then have that as an option. But if it's at a board game store as part of the library, or if uh, one of my friends buys a copy, then I would be more than happy to experience it again and see what a higher player count style game would be like. Well, we finally reached the end of this vlog. Uh, 26 games is a lot to talk about in a row. Uh, and if you just saw this part two and have not watched part one, uh, then here is a little sneak peek of all of the different games that I covered in part one. Uh, so if you're interested in hearing my thoughts and uh, how any of these play, then uh, please go check out part one of this Board Game Geek Con impressions vlog. And overall, I hope you enjoyed this one and I hope that you found some of this to be informative. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel, including all of these producer-level Patreon backers. If you too would like to directly support these videos, then please go to johngetsgames.com support to see a variety of ways with which you could do that. Also, if you enjoyed this video, please consider clicking the like button down below as well as the subscribe button. Thanks for watching.